Hello. Good. Well, good morning, everybody. If we could find our way to a seat, that would be wonderful. Wow. This is amazing to have this many people here and even in our overflows to honor the life and the legacy of Anna Hayford. I want to welcome you in behalf of the Hayford family. And I want to tell you this before we get going, that one of the greatest joys and privileges of Deborah's and my life has been pastoring Jack and Anna Hayford for the last three years. We have loved being Anna Hayford's pastor, and so here we are celebrating her life. Uh, it was the second to the last time that we saw Anna before she went home to be with Jesus, and we sat down by her bed and had an extensive conversation. We told her that in the fall we're going to be going to St. Petersburg to visit our four square missionaries, Kim and Steve Cecil, there. And she started talking about St. Petersburg. And then she started talking about city after city after city that she had been blessed to visit during her lifetime. And she stopped with a winsome look in her eye and she said, with a tear that started to form in her eye, she said, I have been so blessed beyond what I could ever imagine when I was a little girl to go all over the world and to travel to all of these wonderful places. And then we remembered that she still had one more place to travel that I hadn't been. She's there today. Anna Hayford is in the presence of the Lord. And she's traveled to a place none of us have had an opportunity to go, but all of us, we hope and pray that everybody in this room and will have given their heart to the Lord and will find their way to follow her there. Well, this morning, we're going to start the service by singing a song that Anna Hayford sang, I'm sure, hundreds, if not thousands of times in this very room. Would you stand with me as we declare the glory of Jesus and sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. want to say that feels right, doesn't it? Praise the Lord. Uh, before you're seated, would you find a, a person or two next to you and just say, I think Anna would love that. Go ahead. and. Uh... Well, as you're seated, I want to say uh, good afternoon on behalf of the family. Um, I am uh, Pastor Doug Anderson, and I know that it's been a, a while since I've done anything on this platform. It, well, actually, I've never done anything on this platform because it's, it's all new, isn't it? Uh, it's just, uh, but it's beautiful to be home, and uh, so nice to have all of you here. Uh, 
joining us today and, and celebrating. You know, I want to set just a little bit of, of context today. Uh, you're you're going to hear from, from family member and friends today. There's a whole lot of wonderful stories that will, will happen. And I, I want to make sure that we understand that this is a service that Anna actually planned. She was part and parcel uh, in discussion. She and Pastor uh, sat down and uh, determined pieces that they, they wanted to have in this uh, particular guest, the structure of it. Um, all of that was done prior to her uh, promotion into heaven. And there were things that she wanted you to know. In fact, she had certain things that she wanted to make sure people knew and certain things she wanted to make sure people did. And that was really so much about what uh, her life was, was about, was leading people in just the, the gentlest of ways. And I'm sure if we took time, everybody in the room has some type of story of that, something that they learned uh, from, from Anna. Our, our, our day to day is bound to be filled with some tears. I know I, I plan to have some. I've already started uh, today uh, because for those, uh, it'd be few that wouldn't be familiar, but she's also my mother-in-law and, uh, and she's greatly, greatly missed. Um, we're here today as we, as we honor mom, uh, grandma, great grandma, aunt, uh, friend, pastor. Uh, I, I can't even think of all the different areas that there would be, be relationship that we would have. And she had lots of different titles to lots of different people. So there's, there's bound to be some areas of sorrow uh, today. But this day is certainly going to be filled with joy as well and, and laughter. I plan to do that too. And I want to release you to do that. It is okay. Anna would love that uh, because there was nothing she liked more than sitting around and having a hearty laugh with, uh, with people because life was happy when you were around her. Amen? And so um, I want to make sure that we, we keep that in mind. But, but remember the primary purpose today. Our primary purpose, anytime we gather for a memorial like this, uh, our primary purpose in this room, this house right now, is to bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. And that was everything that mom's life was all about. In fact, Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says this, you are epistles written on our hearts, the letters written on our hearts. You're known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is of the heart. That is the story of Anna's life. She was a living epistle of everything that Jesus had done so that all of her life became a testimony, a sermon to everyone that she, uh, she spoke to. Not having to preach, but having to live in such a way that it began to change people. So you're going to hear a lot today about her, but I want us to always remember that everything you hear about her ultimately points to Jesus Christ and uh, letting people know that as she honored him, uh, she would want us to honor him today, too. And so as we begin, Pastor Tim Clark, my friend, the pastor of this church, is going to come and uh, lead us in a point of invocation as we invite the presence of the Lord in this place today. Pastor. Thank you, Doug. Thank you, Doug. Uh, it's so important that we remember that this is all about glorifying and honoring Jesus. So can we do that right now? Father, we stop and we turn our hearts to you. Lord, we remember Anna and we're going to engage uh, and embrace all of the things that we can recall that she did that changed our life, but we recognize the reason that she could impact our life the way it was impacted was because of your spirit working through her. So right now, God, we glorify you. We turn our gaze to you. We turn our hearts to you. And we thank you that we get to celebrate the life of one who lived her life with her gaze and her thoughts and her heart and her life turned toward you. We give you this time together as we come together and we worship you, honoring you, remembering your servant Anna. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Anna's life today. My privilege is to establish what the truest context was and that she lived the Word of God. And we establish that as we read together excerpts from the book of Romans, chapter 8. I consider 
that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with all the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this we hope we were for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. When we were looking for scriptures to read at the, at the service, Dan suggested that, that scripture. I've never read that scripture at a memorial service before. How many of you agree it's very fitting? Can we say hallelujah to that scripture? It, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth. We're about to introduce somebody who's very dear to Pastor Jack and Anna. When Pastor Jack was the president of the Foursquare Gospel, the Ch International Church of the Foursquare Gospel, Glenn uh, Burris worked closely with him as the general supervisor. And Glenn and Debbie and Jack and Anna have a very close relationship. Now, Glenn has been serving for a number of years as our president now, following Pastor Jack of the International Church of the Foursquare Gospel. Can we welcome together Dr. Glenn Burris? Anna Hayford, what a very, very special lady. In Acts chapter 8 and 9, Luke records two brief accounts of people who left an incredible impact on others. In Acts chapter 8, Luke references a man named Philip. In Acts chapter 9, Luke references a woman named Tabitha or Dorcas. We're told that Philip was an evangelist and that Tabitha sewed coats for the poor. It's written that Philip's ministry brought joy to the entire city. It's also recorded that Tabitha's death caused many to gather around her bed and weep. My summary of their life, if people rejoice in your presence and weep in your absence, your life has had impact. If people rejoice in your presence or weep in your absence, your life has had impact. That was Anna Hayford. My conviction today is that Philip, Tabitha, and Anna all reflected Jesus. They were devoted to him and inspired by him to give their life away for others. Now, when we don't reflect Jesus, then I think it's safe to assume that people may tend to rejoice in our absence and weep in our presence. <laughs> Help us, Lord, to reflect your son, Jesus, in all that we say and in all that we do. This week, my wife uh, helped me pick out a tie, and uh, she's the color coordinator in our family, and I think we have a picture of a tree. Now, she got it as close as uh, Nordstrom's would um, 
in the affordable Thai price range at Nordstrom's, there's multiple tables and you definitely have to turn the ties over. <laughs> but she picked out a tie that would come as close to matching the color of this majestic and beautiful tree. It's a jacaranda tree. You've seen them also in white and pink. When Pastor Jack and I served together for the five years at the central office, we'd often find ourselves riding around the city and he would point out a jacaranda tree and he said, oh, that's a Jack and Anna tree. <laughs> and I will never ever see a jacaranda tree differently. And so I wear this tie today, Pastor Jack, in honor of the memory of Anna. I was looking up the word jacaranda and discovered that its original meaning means fragrance. And I just thought, what a special, what a special meeting. Every time I think about Anna, I think about this lady that um, always smiled. I mean, she had this, if you see the pictures, she had this engaging um, smile that just melted your heart. I was even there at times where she was going through her most trying days, and she had that smile. Now, I've also seen her give Pastor Jack a few looks that I could only surmise <laughs> that there was a language between them that, in fact, I was looking through the picture gallery and I think I saw one of those looks. <laughs> Remember this, your story will be told and it will be repeated. Question is, Will it be written up in a book and described as people who rejoiced in your presence and wept in your absence? I know Jesus today better, Pastor Jack, because of Anna. I love him better. I serve him more diligently. Pastor Jack, I love you. And I'm available 24-7. I won't do your laundry. <laughs> but if you need to go somewhere... You need somebody to talk to, I'm there. And thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing the love of your life, Anna, with all of us. Amen. We're going to spend a little bit of time in uh, worship right now. And coming to the platform are many of the grandchildren uh, that uh, are all involved in worship or church ministry somewhere uh, around the country. Yesterday, with a time with just family, we talked a little bit about the importance of legacy. Legacy is something that's passed down from one generation to the next, but it requires that generation to make the decision that they will nurture what it is that's been entrusted to them. Uh, it's really an honor today to get to introduce uh, uh, this group that's coming to lead us in worship and, and lead us before the throne room of the Lord, into the throne room of the Lord before his throne and into his presence uh, because every one of them are, are grandkids and it's just a nice and, uh, and touching picture of this. Let's stand together as we prepare to worship the Lord today.
During the weeks leading to Anna's passing into the presence of Jesus, we spoke a number of times about this service. I wanted her to express things that she would desire. And she said, honey, I want Betsy to talk about heaven. She was referencing the lady that's going to come now, my sister-in-law, Betsy Hayford. She and my brother, very fruitful pastors for many years of leadership. and. Uh, I want you to know that this is not a woman who is a wild-eyed fanatic and without biblical basic basis to the things she says and about what she thinks. If she gets a little excited about this, she'll know that as a result of being met miraculously when she had a heart attack that was expected to take her life in first signs, that she came back and she tells about seeing heaven and visiting for a short time. Betsy Hayford. Good afternoon. I shared one title with Anna that no one else got to share. She was my sister-in-law for 
almost 54 years for Jim and me, but 64 for Jack and Anna. We were married on the same day of the year. We got married on their 10th anniversary because they said they'd buy us dinner on the first anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> so being Bible college students, that seemed really good. So we did that. Anna was my sister-in-law. We shared a special place in life. About six months ago, Jim and I were seeing Jack and Anna at their house, and it was the first time I'd had the opportunity to share with them my amazing adventure into the living presence of Almighty God. As I watched Jack get excited, as he often would, and Anna was sitting in her chair there. Jim and Jack went on to go out of the room, and I knelt down in front of Anna and took her hands, and I said, let me tell you more about my journey. And I watched the transformation of a lady who knew that she knew, but we always have our fingers crossed, you know, hoping that what we know is what it is. And I watched her face transform as if the presence of God was just, there's no word to describe what the presence of God did that day on her face, but it thrilled me. It's been 18 years ago that I had a series of heart attacks that took my life three different times. I don't know how long I was out of my body because there is no time there is no calendar. There is no watch on the arm of Almighty God. When we're in his presence, that's what we are. You don't care what time it is. You don't care how long it's been. You're in his presence. April 24, 1999 is my new birthday in my life. It was the worst day of my life. It was the best day of my life. It was both. Folks, I can't even see you, but I know you're there. Um, <laughs> you are going to be amazed at what God has prepared for us. You think you know? It's just an imagination compared to what it really is. I come alive. My real life is when I get to be where that story took place. Mm. I'm going to read most of it so I don't just go off the rails here and start talking. My last name is Hayford. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned from the best. <laughs> My husband told me later the day that that happened, April 24th, 18 years ago, he watched me flatline three different times. I only remember the first time I flatlined. The pain was so incredible. I couldn't stand it. I was raised by a heathen family. And don't you always wonder, what will I say when I'm not knowing what I'm saying? Do you ever wonder about that? I did. And I was so thankful that when the pain was so incredible, what I cried out was, oh, Jim, instead of something else. <laughs> and then he said the first flatline happened. I simply had to escape the intensity of the pain, and my body shut down entirely. People ask me, did you see the bright light? Did you sense motion? Did you feel anything? The all answer to all three questions is no. Dying or moving from my body, take this for Anna, dying or moving from my body was not a painful experience at all. I was there in extreme pain, and then I was gone. There was no pain. It was freedom from everything that had tied me to this earth. What I, where did I go? I went to a presence. I went into his presence. We talk about heaven all the time. But you know the incredible thing about heaven is his presence. That's what heaven really is, his presence. I went to a presence that was beyond beautiful and beyond calm. There was no pain at all. What did I experience? You know, I wasn't able to articulate my experience for almost three years. I'm not certain why, but it was as if my mouth was closed 
All I could say was the scripture that lets us know, I had not seen, ear had not heard, neither has it entered in the hearts of man what God has prepared for those who love him. It was too precious and it was too personal and frankly, nearly unbelievable even to me what I had just experienced. I didn't want to be doubted or questioned. I didn't want anything sensational to be exploited about it. It needed to be my journey, just my journey for a while. I did not go to a place, I went to a presence. I was moved to in him, in him. Do a study on those words, just those two words sometime. It will amaze you. The most significant thing was the incredible totality of unity, love, peace, all at one time. You know, I have three children, I have seven grandchildren, I have five great-grandchildren, and my heart's desire is simply that at least that number love me entirely at the same time and be happy with me. And when I got into his presence, the unity was beyond anything I could have ever imagined beyond anything. Can you picture unity? We pastored for a number of years. You know what the lack of unity is when you pastor. (laughs) Unity, love, peace, all at the same time. All I know, and this is beautiful, is that absolutely everything was in one accord. It was in one accord. There was not a descent anywhere. My heart had always longed for this, and now I was experiencing it to a greater degree than any concept I had ever dreamed. The old song indeed is true. It is joy unspeakable and full, full of glory. Next was perhaps the phenomenal music that I heard. We sang one song earlier about we'll join the everlasting throng and crown him Lord of Lords. You know, we get to do that. That music in heaven is beyond any music you've ever heard at any time in your life. The greatest orchestras, the greatest choirs do not begin to compare to what we will experience in his presence. Nothing I had ever heard came even close to the magnificence of what I had entered into. Thirdly, there are colors beyond every shade of color I had ever seen. You know, even the 84 box of Crayola crayons (laughs) doesn't compare to the colors in his presence. It was astounding. Flowers. Blue sky. I'm from Seattle. Blue sky is really looked forward to. Blue sky, flowers, peace, unity, music, all the things we love. Another significant experience was the reuniting with my dear mother-in-law, Dolores Hayford. She's there. She greeted me. I've been asked often, what did she look like? People want to know, what do we have when we're there? You know what? She looked like the lady I always knew. If you knew her when she was a child, I'll bet to you she'd look like a child. I knew her as my mother-in-law who lived with us. She was mama. She was mama in every sense of the word. And I can't explain this adequately, but I'll just tell you, the Bible says we are his train. The train, the temple is his train. She came from his train and greeted me. And I knew it was her. She was my mother-in-law for almost 50 years. And that's who greeted me. I knew her. And she was happy to see me. (laughs) She looked just like the lady I had known, lived with, and loved dearly. What age was she is another question I get asked. She looked just like herself at her peaceful best. She was not an age. She was simply herself. She was in him also. 
I don't know how long I was gone from my body. Time and calendars have no place in his presence. I just know that when I came back to my body, the, pr the pain was there again. In his presence, no pain. Not in his presence in heaven, in eternity, there was pain again. Prayer is the most amazing tool in our arsenal. My son, Jim Jr., basketball coach in Washington at one of the universities who tells everybody how high to jump and they do it. <laughs> I woke up 12 hours after all of this started and my son Jim Jr. was there with his dad and brother and sister and Jim Jr. had his hands on the side of that hospital bed on those two rails that were pulled up there. And as I came back into my body, this is what I heard. God, I haven't asked for much, but I'm telling you, heal my mom now. <laughs> Coach boss has even got around. It's just amazing. <laughs> and that's the words I heard as I came back into my body after not knowing where I'd been for the past 12 hours was my son utilizing his greatest weapon in God, the voice of prayer, telling God, please bring my mom back. The clock had passed 12 hours since I was conscious. I lined, flatlined the first time quite early that Saturday morning, but I was not dead that entire time. The doctors used the defibrillators on me multiple times. They started my heart manually with manipulation also. Jim saw much of this take place. My kids saw much of it take place, but I was unaware of any of it because I was in his presence. And in his presence, folks, there's fullness of joy. Fullness of joy. I know that I know that I know what heaven is. And it thrilled me about six months ago to kneel down in front of Anna and tell her about my journey to heaven and watch the excitement of soon coming into that actual present light her up like every light bulb inside of her body came on. Thank God for my sister-in-law, Anna. I loved her dearly. I will miss her, but I'm going to join her not too long from now. When you live till you're in your 80s, the 60s are a very memorable time, especially because of the music that so resonated to at least a generation and a half of people at that time. The folk songs that were done by such groups as the uh, Limelighters, Peter, Paul, and Mary, and others uh, captured the uh, heartbeat of the nation and were sung just about everywhere people knew in the Hayford home was one where uh, Anna and I enjoyed the music and there were always uh, messages, uh, songs that said something of worth and uh, very timely and our, our kids enjoyed them too. We uh, just had three of the children at that time and uh, while we had this, uh, this season of music that was sweeping the nation, uh, we bought an album that the title of which was Through Children's Eyes. And that album of music uh, was based on the need for, you know, for parents to listen to their kids. Well, believe me, we did, but our kids were such a vital part of our life. Uh, that this uh, album took our whole household. We all loved it. And uh, it's uh, reflected things that really for the happiness of our kids in our home to us and them, we believe. Uh, they'd say the same thing growing up. The Limelighters album had a song on it that was called Morningtown. And uh, I'd found a, a, a CD of that. And coming back from that uh, drive down the coast uh, up in where Anne had gone to want to see the waves that day. Uh, we listened to that album, having just found a recent edition of it. When we got done with the album, she says, Honey, I want you to go back to that song, Morning Town. And we did. She said, I want that sung 
at my memorial service. That's about eight or nine weeks ago that she, she said that. And as we sing it, I think your heart will be touched. She wanted you to know that to her, it reflected how much fun we had in so many ways with our children. We were a family that was happy, all of us together. And uh, this tender song, when I heard replayed it that day, when she said at her service, it, it touched my heart. Would you just listen to this recording of the Limelighters singing Morning Town? It's great to see both the heaven side of a family that honors the Lord and to see the earthly side that does nutty stuff like listening to songs like that. Uh, that was a little bit of a whiplash for me when I married into this family to see, <laughs> see some of those things. You should get them to sing some for you sometimes. Mom wanted to have um, each of the kids have an opportunity to share some. I want to invite the, her four children. You've already heard from the, the 11 grandchildren, and if... Uh, the kids would come up and uh, share their tributes. Uh, we'd love to uh, hear from them. Let's uh, welcome uh, Krista and Mark, uh, Jack Third, and Rebecca. Okay, we're going in reverse birth order. <laughs> if you care to know or if you don't know, that's what's happening right now. So I get to start. Thank you so much for coming today. This is overwhelming to us, your love, your support. Many, many people have sent cards, brought meals, offered encouragement, stood with us, prayed over this past year. We are so incredibly grateful for every text, every, every comment, everything that just continues and has continued to be extended to each one of us. 
I would like to personally thank my my own personal support group because <laughs> I think I've put them through a lot in the last year. Um, our staff at the Church on the Way Santa Clarita, you have stood with us through a very trying time. And I thank you for being there, listening, giving me days off, <laughs> um, and just your ongoing prayer and support of our family. Brant and Emily, Emma and Carl, I love you guys. Thank you for standing with me. You listened to me process more than any children should probably have to listen to their mother process and say the same things over and over again. But thank you for cooking dinners and cleaning the house and, and being there in this time for me. And Doug, it's probably good I cannot really see you in this moment. <laughs> thank you for just getting me, for understanding me and knowing what I needed when I didn't know, for hearing my heart, for sharing my life. Thank you for loving my mom as you did your own. Rebecca, come, 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 come. Uh, I don't know, I don't have the words to thank you for walking this unknown road with me. You've been my confidant, constant companion, and comic relief. Yes, that's, that's, that's been good. Should we tell them about the interpretive dance? We were dance. going to do an interpretive <laughs> dance during the last song. Yeah. And, uh, we sort of had some hand motions that we We decided we that do. might not be a good idea. Um, it's fun to make it You have been courageous and determined. You have also been sensitive and compassionate if you have cared for mom and dad, and you are a great daughter and a great sister, and I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. I love you. So I was with my third grade lunch group when I pulled out a peanut butter, jelly, and butter sandwich out of my Holly Hobby lunchbox. In no uncertain terms, this group of well-informed eight-year-olds let me know that this was not cool to have butter on my peanut butter and jelly sandwich. <laughs> I was horrified because I love B, P, B, and J sandwiches. <laughs> How could this be a problem? My mom always made it this way for me, but I felt bad nonetheless. When I got home to share my day with mom, I let her know about the sandwich situation. She asked me, do you like butter on your peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Yes, I replied, to which she said, then who cares what they think? <laughs> Years later, in revisiting the situation, I realized I had learned one of my favorite two things about my mom. My mom was strictly herself. She didn't strive to please people at the expense of who she was. She was Anna, a Nebraska farm girl that had no problem with someone stopping by the house and seeing her in her duster and slippers. But she was also just as comfortable and herself at a stately dinner with any number of famous names in the room. She was graceful and dignified but the woman inside was always simply, purely, and beautifully my mom. I loved that about her. Secondly, I admired her stability. She kept life normal, down to earth, and practical, all the things little kids need. There were schedules and regular meal times, chores, and errands. She kept life kind of predictable and stable in the midst of a ministry that was growing wonderfully busy and was less than predictable. She herself was a stable force. She was solid in Jesus, disciplined in her tasks as mother and wife, firm yet loving with her children, and steady in her demeanor. One of the only times I really recall her flying off the handle was during my little house on the prairie days when I tried calling her Ma. <laughs> I only, only tried that once. The way Mom lived in front of me allowed me to embrace God's call for my life in ministry as I saw through her how a family can be happy stable and normal in the best kind of way. So today I honor you, Mom. Being your daughter is one of the greatest blessings the Lord has given me, and I love you.
after uh, years of pastoring and, and who knows what the Lord has in the days ahead, but I currently work with developmentally disabled adults and that song that mom had sung is one that I sing with them regularly. <laughs> And uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing that wasn't mentioned is that that album, whether it is in album form or CD form, I don't think, I'm not sure, but I think we may have actually gotten it in cassette tape form at one point. Mom would regularly give all of us kids that album again. <laughs> About every 15 years or so, we got that album again. So the last one was just fairly recently. And uh, it's, you know, it just, it does bring back so many memories. I do want to say, Doug, you said that you had no idea what this family was going to be like when you married into it. And you may forget that when we worked together in facilities, we had alter egos that it's good that no one else knows what they are, <laughs> except the privileged few. About 20 years ago, my grandmother went to heaven. And uh, I remember watching my dad and my uncle, who are here, and seeing how wonderful it was to watch them tribute their mom. And I'd looked forward to that opportunity, not in the way of looking forward to my parents passing, but looking forward to the opportunity as a son to lead people who would be paying tribute to my parents. Unfortunately, some things happened yesterday that I was not able to actually be at the family burial of my mother. And it was a, a, a hard thing for me. It was, as you would imagine, a terribly hard decision, and I'm sure that there's many who would, you know, say shame on you, and how could you be so disrespectful to your own mother to not be there? But I'm going to share something with you that explains why I wasn't there. I recall as a young boy asking my mom a question that really was very grave for a four-year-old, in fact, its question would be grave for any of us. Who do you love the most? In my case, I was asking my mom, Mom, do you love me or dad the most? <laughs> Four-year-old thought. She immediately told me she loved dad the most. <laughs> so my heart never sank as she so lovingly and simply explained, always love your spouse the most. Always give your whole life to your spouse. I learned that from my mom. And it doesn't take away at all from any other love. In fact, it only enhances other love. It only allows you to love and display love more greatly. The explanation was so simple and so profound that I grew up with a sublime confidence that someday God had for me a spouse that would love me the same way. And I want to say thank you, Darcy. I know you're watching over the streaming feed right now. This is one of the very first life lessons I remembered that my mom taught me, the ones that I really remember shaped my life. And as I lay in bed the night before last, watching what my wife was going through, and thinking about what my decisions were, it would be, and I looked at that lesson and I said, you're not disrespecting or dishonoring your mother. You're doing what she taught you to do.
And so, yesterday morning, I took my wife and took her back home to where she could feel the kind of peace that she needed to feel because of ill at ease with, with certain relational issues. And I took care of her. And at four in the morning, she told me, get back down here. And I love her for that, too. And I sit here and I look at pictures of my mom and I see in her face a beauty that is not just the beauty of a child looking at their parent. My mom was a beautiful woman. And I remember her blue eyes. Never thought much about them. But since she passed, it seems like every song that mentioned blue eyes has been coming to my mind. And I think of my mom. And I think of how she watched us and loved us and taught us so many things. I had written down five lessons, and I just gave you one. And we will be here forever if I try and get through the five. But I do want to say this one other lesson that mom taught me. Besides the fact that she loved us so beautifully and you always knew you were loved. I got an email from my son the other day and he said, Dad, I'm sorry that you lost the one person that you always knew loved you. And that's not taking away from my dad, but I don't know any kids who, when dad comes home and they're in trouble, always knows that dad loves them, but mom does. <laughs> Seek and you shall find. A biblical principle. I've told this story before multiple times to people. But I remember, I remember being a little boy trying to find my favorite toy. And mom came in and she didn't just go find it for me. She took me over to her toy box, which was about the size of a house to a child my, my size at the time, and taught me how to look, how to seek. She taught me how to systematically go through that toy. I found this little minute toy, literally about that big, in this huge toy box full of all kinds of things. And I found what I was seeking. To this day, people around me will tell you that when something's lost, I find it. I've seen it happen at work. People lose things, and they just can't find them. And I find them. I've seen it happen at home. I've seen it happen under the seat of the car where things get lost, and we usually find things that we <coughs> forgot existed. And sometimes things we wish never did exist. It helps to have that rational approach that my mom taught me, but I'll tell you the real lesson that she taught me. Don't stop looking until you find it. If something's lost, don't stop looking until you find it. And that's true whether what's lost is a little plastic toy or what's lost is part of a relationship in your family or what's lost is a sense of love that you feel you should have for someone who's close to you. Seek and you will find. Today, we have lost a friend, an example, a grandmother, and I could go through the list, Doug beautifully added to the list. I want to say that I want to ask you to do this for me because my aunt just said sister-in-law. My father's lost a wife. 
I've lost a mother. Some of you have lost friends. Some of you have lost a pastor. I want you to say who Anna Hayford was to you. Let's just say it together right now. Mother. Let's say that again. Mother. We've all lost something today. But I want to tell you, because of the lesson she taught me, I'm going to keep looking for her. And I will not stop looking for her till I'm walking with her on the streets of gold. But more beautiful than that, loved ones, is the fact that I know, because of these lessons and so many others, that I'm going to find her every day. Every day until then, I'm going to find her again. I'll keep looking, and we'll keep finding Loved ones, yes, we've lost something. We know that it's only temporary. We know it's only for this moment. And we know the day of joy of all of us being together is coming. Praise God. But don't be afraid to remember the sense of loss we have. I believe God put that into our hearts so that we would understand Two things, so that we would understand that we can lose things in life, and there's things in life he intends for us to go find. But I believe most of all, he programmed that sense of loss into us so that we had some basis of understanding of what it cost him to send his son for us. We have a sense of loss but let us seek and let us find. Good afternoon. I'd like to take just a couple of minutes and share a couple of memories with you. These memories are the earliest memories of my life. Thinking back, and digging into my mind, I find these really fragmentary memories that are really more like a snapshot than an event. From other things that I've learned through my life, I know I can put those snapshots into a context and I know what they're about, but the memory itself is just, it's just like I said, just a picture the first memory is my mom looking over the open top of a Dutch door. And I remember just looking up and seeing her there. That's the snapshot. What I know that that represents is my mom coming to pick me up from childcare at Angela's Temple. I don't know how old I was at the time, but I know that you know, in the building where I went to Sunday school many times through the years, there was a gymnasium in the building, and upstairs there was this, as I remember it, kind of an elongated room where they had child care for smaller children. That memory speaks to me because it tells me that from my earliest days, from certainly from my earliest memories, my mother was making sure that I knew that I was with the people of God. I was, had some place where I belonged within the church. It was several years later that I came to make a personal decision to follow Christ, but from my earliest memories, I was being taught that I was part of the people of God. And being part of the people of God not only meant that I had some kind of a theoretical relationship with this corporate body, but it involved being there. It involved attending church, attending services. I was part of the body of Christ and that necessitated being with the body of Christ. The second memory I have 
is my mom and I being on a bus. And once again, that's the snapshot from what I learned later. I know that we were on a bus going downtown to see a specialist. You see, when I was young, I wore corrective shoes as my legs weren't straight. And on this one occasion, my mom wanted to see if I could go ahead and get regular shoes for a change. She took me into the doctor and the doctor examined me and had a very negative report. He said the corrective shoes didn't appear to be doing any good at all. I would probably have to have braces on my legs. And he sent us downtown to a specialist to be examined. I heard my mom tell this story many times, how she took me downtown and as, she, as we were getting on the bus, she just said a little prayer to God to touch her son. I remember being on that bus, once again, just like a snapshot. I don't remember getting off the bus. I don't remember seeing the specialist. But I know from that story that my mom told me that we got to the specialist's office. He examined me, and he said, there's nothing wrong. Go ahead, and get whatever shoes you want. My mom made sure that I knew this story. And what that taught me was not only was I part of a people, but God cared about me personally. God knew me, knew me as an individual. And he cared about me as an individual. These two truths that we are part of the people of God and that God also knows us, each one individually, complement each other beautifully, and are two things that my mother bequeathed to me that I can pass on to you. Christ is risen is the central grounding truth of our faith. And because Christ is risen and has become the first fruits of the resurrection of the dead, we have the hope and the confidence looking forward to the future resurrection. And we have the promise of God that we will not precede those who are, have fallen asleep before us, but the dead in Christ shall rise first then those of us who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds forever to be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Amen. I got my mother's height. <laughs> she actually was, I never actually got up to her height. She was one inch taller than me. But when my kids were in junior high, they were so impressed that they were passing me up. And, um, and they did notice that grandma was shorter than me. And they, asked, they said, well, how old were you when you passed grandma up? And I said, I didn't, I never passed her up. I caught her on the way back down. <laughs> So I would like to thank everybody as well as Krista. Krista and I have been on a different journey uh, through this process because we're the local kids. And, um, and you've been, many of you have been so helpful and so supporting and so encouraging through this whole time. But I also don't want to neglect to tell my brothers thank you. They were in contact with mom and dad constantly, and I know they were upholding all of us in their prayers as well. They just don't live as close. And so thank you, Jack and Mark. And uh, I've appreciated the support that we've gotten from the whole family 
of our family and the whole family of God. So thank you very much. When I was preparing my remarks, I was um, struck by the word extraordinary. My parents have lived an extraordinary life. But extraordinary doesn't happen because of one person, it happens because of two. And I think that my mom, there's a lot of times that people didn't look at her as extraordinary in the same way they looked at dad because she wasn't always the person up front. She could be, she did a good job. The other day in the garage, I found about 50 teaching tapes of my mom's. Unfortunately, they're on cassettes, so I will have to either see if Amazon has a cassette player <laughs> or transfer them all before I can listen to them. But I think when I think about my mom, I think of the word simple. And I think our culture talks about the, looks at the word simple as it's plain or dull. And yet, simple brings things down to their most essential priorities and their purest form. She was a woman who wasn't simple in the sense of boring. She was simple in the sense of, the, of defined. She was a well-defined person. And she knew the things that were important to her, and those are the things she prioritized all the time. There was no waffling with my mom. I've thought as we've gone through this process, you know, I described to myself one day, dad's the one who climbed Mount Sinai. Um, mom was the rock we all stood on. And she stayed the same. She was rock solid. She kept everything running. And so that there's this juxtaposition of this extraordinariness and the simplicity that were both present in my mom. One thing I appreciate about her is that in that simplicity, she was a very risky person. She was willing to leap out and do something that was against the norm of what she grew up with. She was a small town girl. And she was the only one, the first in her family to go to college. And she went to big wicked Los Angeles from North Platte, Nebraska <laughs> to do it. And so not only was she the first one to go to college, she was the first one to you know, cross the country to a venue that was unfamiliar to what everything she had grown up, up with. That takes risk. And she was willing to fearlessly confront. That takes risk too. Um, and believe me, if you were ever disciplined by Anna, you didn't forget it very fast. <laughs> she got her point across. She was as strong and fearless in her correction as dad was. And I liked that about her. It taught me how to be a mom. It taught me that you don't just pass everything off to the dad and say, oh, you can take care of this. I could do that too. And that as we raised our children, that I stood in that same authority that I had seen in my mom. She was, but that's risky. That's risky to do. It's also risky to lay your life down and serve a ministry that few people see. And I've heard a lot of words describe my mom over my lifetime, and I've kind of chuckled sometimes at it. They're all true. Um, but, but it was only one side of her. It was, she's gentle. She's quiet. Quiet confidence is one I've heard a few times. Um, and I, I would look at those and say, well, that's true. But she was sassy. She, you did. I heard everybody laugh when they saw that one picture. That is the look, just in case you're wondering. That is the look. And, um, but she served a ministry. When I say she was the foundation we stood on, that was true of Dad, too. And um, he could never have done what he did. This church could never have been what it became if it wasn't for her. And the things... And the things that she's chose to serve, of choosing to serve her husband and choosing to serve her home. And she served it with a passion and call in ministry. This is a little girl who went to Bible college from North Platte. She felt called to ministry, and yet she chose one that few saw. But she served it with passion and call and purpose. And one of the things within our home that I really loved was that she knew how to create a place to dwell. It wasn't just a house. 
I wouldn't even call it a, just a home. It was a place of dwelling that allowed the presence of God's spirit to come live at our house. And she did it in everything, everything, every touch that she put on anything was intentional and beautiful. And she, she, she was simple, but she was classy. Classy and sassy. That could be like two points to a sermon. <laughs> she added the sparkle. And to a large extent, she was the sparkle. There's a couple things I'd like to share that you may not know about my mom. Um, she did confess at a women's retreat one year, uh, you can raise your hand if you were at this retreat, that she secretly always wanted to be a mermaid. <laughs> Somebody did buy her a mermaid costume. I don't think she ever wear it, wore it, um, at least not in my presence. <laughs> it's probably for the best. Um, she, for her 80th birthday, she decided she would take herself out and get her ears pierced. She didn't tell anybody. She didn't tell anybody before, and she didn't tell anybody after. She just waited till we just discovered this. That was the sassy side, just saying. Um, she was a QVC junkie. In fact, my sister and I have wondered what is going to happen to QVC now <laughs> that Anna's gone. But she wasn't just a shopper. She loved QVC because she loved to give. And she would order things. I don't know. I know I saw Max Lyle earlier. I know you're here. I do want you to know I did see in her little phone book the address of where the peanut butter comes from. So we can make sure we get that to you, and you can continue the peanut butter supply. Um, because there was a special peanut butter QVC sold, and she would get it for Max. My mother loved to give. And that's why she loved to shop. It wasn't for herself. It was for us. She, um, another thing you may not know about my mother is that she could fix anything, heal anything, mend anything, and kill any rodent. <laughs> so uh, before my oldest son was married, his soon-to-be wife lived with Graham and Grandpa for a, a couple months. And Melissa got up, she was the first one up one morning, and she went in the kitchen, and there was a rat. And uh, she did exactly what I would do, go find someone else, because I did not inherit the rodent-killing gene. So Melissa uh, went to find Grandpa, who was up, because he's always up early. And she found him, and she goes, Grandpa, there's a rat in the kitchen. And so he got up, went down to the kitchen, closed all the doors and said, we're going to wait for Grandma to get up. <laughs> I don't know who you're going to call now, but I just want you to know I have called Brant, I have called Doug, I have called Brian and Kyle. I, I don't do this either, so I'm with, I'm not going to, I'm not calling Krista. She apparently didn't inherit the gene either. <laughs> The day my mom received her diagnosis, it's just over a year ago right now, um, the Lord gave me a picture. It was one of the most beautiful pictures I've ever seen. And I knew I was looking at the outskirts of heaven. Betsy, when you talk about it, you can't describe it. There's not words. It's like I know that's what I saw was the outskirts of heaven. It was beautiful. The, the closest, I actually Googled, because it was a big meadow. I Googled memo, meadows with red flowers. And the closest I've been able to find is Tuolumne Meadows in Yosemite. So if you've ever been there, it's the earthly version of what I saw. But it was this beautiful meadow, and it had uh, the high grass and red flowers. They, I just remember, they were red. There were mountains all around, and we were walking toward a river. It was all of us. And we were wearing the most beautiful clothes. They were white, they were flowing, they just, it, it was beautiful, and music, and the celebration, and mom was in the middle, and she was all dressed up too. And I understood that we, we were going to this river, and mom was gonna cross it, but none of the rest of us were. And the thing that was moving to me is that I understood the Lord saying that we were preparing a member of the bride to go to meet the bridegroom. 
And as big of a loss as it is not to have mom on this side of the river, any one of us going to heaven is never a loss. It's never a loss. In fact, as someone I once heard speak said, turn to your neighbor and say, heaven is never a loss. Today I'm thankful that on, not only do I have the legacy of a mother who taught me how to live a well-lived life and a well-defined life, but I have the legacy of watching how she prepared to meet the ultimate bridegroom, Jesus. I'm very thankful for my mom. Thank you very much. That's some of the home side and fantastic to see and uh, watch. Uh, there's probably numbers that could speak as friends on, uh, on Anna's behalf. We want to have two uh, friends that were not just friends, but were really prayer partners that stood with her. And uh, Marianne and Darylin, if you would uh, come on up. Uh, Marianne Pienka and Darylin Graves uh, not only hold that role as friend, but Many times would sit and uh, spend time with mom in these last few days or last many weeks and just pray with her and walk with her through everything that she was going through. And so uh, let's, let's welcome Mary Ann Pienka and uh, Daryl and Grace. Thank you. Hello, everyone. In 1969, Jack and Anna Hayford, of course, came to a small little church in Van Nuys, California. A few months later in that year, a 29-year-old young woman with two little girls started attending the church as well. That young woman was me. Little did I know that would begin a friendship of 47 years. And that friendship has only grown deeper and sweeter with every passing year. I loved this woman incredibly. She was an incredible woman, an incredible woman. And I'm sorry that everyone did not get to know her and how special she was, as I was privileged to do, and as many of us were. She and I, when we would sit together in church, were really naughty because Anna would come out with these one-liners and we would be sitting in the front row and she and I would start laughing and I'm telling you, we belly laughed. It, it was like the chubby lady in the circus. You, it, it was loud, but we would try so hard to cover our mouths and not be heard, but you could tell by the way our bodies were shaking that we were having a really good time. And Jack sometimes, when he was speaking, I don't know if you remember those days, but he looked sometimes like he was about ready to join in the laughter with us. I used to think then, and I still do, what a joy, how wonderful it was to feel such joy in God's house and to be able to laugh, not always be so serious. It was so fun having her for my friend. Needless to say, we didn't sit together all the time. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a good thing. I want to share something with you that, not so much a memory, but something that for me was the very essence of my friend Anna. It was her core. Before I share that, however, I want to digress a moment and just say a little something about her childhood because I think it's germane to what I want to talk to you about. Most of you who've heard her testimony know this already, but Anna was raised in poverty and she was on, she and her family on welfare for most of her growing up years. Her father wasn't able to work because of a heart condition and the doctor would not allow him to do so. And Anna, she, when she would recount her childhood, and we talked about her childhood and mine a lot actually during the years we knew one another, 
She was never bitter. That is one thing I will say about my friend Anna. That woman did not have a tinge of bitterness in her or complaint. And when she talked about her childhood, it wasn't bemoaning it or complaining about it or, oh, you know, pity poor me. It, these were just facts. These were just facts. She talked about going to welfare with her mom and welfare provided the staples, you know, flour and sugar and things like that, and her clothes, her dresses and her shoes. Her clothes were made of flour sacks because in those days, flour sacks were printed. And so she would get, I don't recall if it was five dresses or seven dresses at a time, but all but two of them were all made alike and she didn't really like them that much. They had cap sleeves and they had kind of a rounded little, not a collar, but just a little rounded thing around her neck. The other two were a little different. They had a little longer sleeve and a Peter Pan collar. And those were her favorites. And she wore those to church services and to special occasions. Now I wanted to say that because in this conversation that she had with me a couple of months ago, and I want to say just before that too, it wasn't just always me ministering to Anna. Believe me, we were iron sharpening iron. There were times when I would get my feathers in such a fluff about something and I'd go talk to her and she'd listen to me for a little while and she'd say, Mary Ann, you need to go talk to Jesus about that. And I'd tell her, but I don't want to talk to him right now about that. <laughs> so she'd let me talk a little more and then I'd get over it and we'd pray together and whatnot. So it was iron sharpening iron. This particular day, and this was probably about two and a half months ago, and she had said this to me, mentioned it before, but it was more in a humorous way. This particular day, it was, it was not humorous. We were in a conversation and somehow we got onto the subject of the way people express themselves. And she said, I know that I'm not very expressive. It's not easy for me to say what I feel. And she said, you know, I, I'm just a simple person, going from what you said, Rebecca, this really fits in well. She said, I'm just a simple person. I'm from a simple town in North Platte, Nebraska. I'm just simple. And she said, I'm not a wordsmith like Jack. I'm just a smith. <laughs> she didn't think she was a word smith, but she could really come out with some lines. But she said it very, in a very kind of condescending way about herself. And I said to her, Anna, you do not realize the incredible gift that God has given you. You don't realize it. For Anna, God has given you the gift of the simplicity of Christ. And Christ's simplicity is not just simple the way we think of simple. It is profound. It is profound. I wanted to quote one scripture here, and it's from 2 Corinthians 11.3 where Paul is talking to the Corinthians, and he says to them, I'm afraid that unless that Satan might deceive you and, and cause you to go astray, as Satan did with Eve, and that you would be led away from the simplicity and the purity in Christ. I want you to know that in my opinion, the core of Anna Marie Hayford was the simplicity of Christ. And I believe that when she was formed in her mother's womb, that was formed in her. Why did I bring up her background? Because it was simple. But Anna Marie Hayford, because she had gone without a lot of things that many people just grow up with and consider normal, that woman treated people who the world would look, out like, look at like down and outers, like failures. 
janitors, and not that they would be a failure, but I'm just talking about people that in perhaps the world's estimation would be a little lower down on the status pole. But I watched that woman, my precious friend, through all these years. She treated the lowest of the low with the same dignity and respect that she treated state leaders with. That is the simplicity of Christ. I wrote here that that word simplicity has to do with no self-seeking. Amber, Am, excuse me, Anna was not a self-seeker. It means generosity as in copious bestowal of generosity. Her giving, she gave all the time, not just of gifts, but her time, her prayers. She was an incredibly giving woman. It means singleness. Singleness as in singleness of mind and unaffectedness. That too, as Rebecca said, she didn't care if she did greet you in her PJs or all dolled up, it didn't matter. When she greeted you, she embraced you and you knew that you were greeting the real, the real Anna. She was so precious. She was an incredible, incredible friend. I think her background enabled her, as I said, to view all people. As we are told in Ephesians, Christ did not treat people with partiality and neither did she. I would pray today for everyone here, including me, that Satan, no matter how long we've walked with Jesus or how much we think we know, that we would never be led astray from the simplicity and the purity in Jesus Christ. That was Anna Hayford as well as Jesus Christ. My friend, I will miss her so much. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I thought maybe I should say if anybody needs to slip out now for the proverbial potty break, I know that we've all been sitting a long time. But it is such a privilege to be given the opportunity to stand and talk about someone that you love so much and who has been so instrumental in your life in such an unexpected way. My wonderful husband Chip and I have reached the age that we find that we do really good with our memory when we put our brains together. <laughs> and so just in these few weeks of Anna's processing her departure for heaven, it's been on my mind a lot been able to spend some time with her. And so I was thinking back, when was the first time I met her? And so I thought about 1971 when we first came to church on the way. But my husband said, no, honey, that isn't the first time we met her. We actually met her in 1967, probably around Christmas. And, and Pastor, I don't know if you'll remember this or not, but we have been four square through and through. I was in a four square church when I was two weeks old. And we attended the Culver City Church. And Pastor Jack and Anna came to what they used to call an awards banquet. And Anna was pregnant with Krista, and I was pregnant with our first child, Michelle. Little do you know the wonderful thread that Jesus does in our lives and how he brings us from one point to another. It wasn't a particularly memorable evening, except Pastor had a lot more hair then. I do remember that, and it was very dark. And Anna had a little tummy, as I did. But when we came here in 1971, and this is no disrespect for the parents that raised me, but God wanted Chip and I and our children and our grandchildren, now one great-grandchild, to have a different legacy. He wanted to take us out that he might bring us in. It says that in Deuteronomy. The Lord says, and Chip's going to say she pronounced Deuteronomy wrong because I never can say it right. But there's a scripture talking about Moses. I brought you out 
that I might bring you in. And he brought us here and so began an incredible journey of health and healing, body, soul, and spirit. And the part with Pastor that was wonderful was the incredible anointing and the teaching and the schooling. But with Anna, it was the hands-on. It was the practical that helped form me with a new mama. And I know I represent probably thousands of women that weren't really young enough to be her daughter, but God used her like a mother in our lives. And I remember so many practical things because that is who she was. She was a practical representation of the living word of God. One of my first memories <clears throat> when we were invited, they used to always invite young couples out on an event uh, to get to know them when you first came to the church. And we went actually to see Jim and Carol Owens musical and so when we came back and we had a time of dinner with them, we had our kids with them. And I remember saying to our daughter, if you do that one more time, and another time I said, okay, Michelle, I'm going to count to three. One, two, and Anna just took me aside and said, why are you counting? <laughs> a revelation. And it was practical things like that that literally took me out. Like I'm saying, I'm not bad-mouthing my mom. Bless her heart, she's in heaven with Anna. But God wanted us to have a different legacy. We would become pastors. He wanted us to pastor different than we would have. He wanted me to mother different than I would have and grandma different than I would have. And it began just a season of such practical, you can call it ministry. I remember a time she came to our house and really taught me to clean. Okay, so this was before granite countertops in the kitchen. This was tile. Do you guys remember tile? <laughs> tile has grout. She came in with a toothbrush. Who knew? And is showing me how to clean the tile. All the time, I'm learning from this woman of God. And she's imparting to me truth and one of the strongest things I remember about her, and it's been mentioned by her own kids, and kids, thank you so much for sharing your mom and dad with those of us that needed new parents. Thank you. But I remember her never trying to perform for anyone. She was Anna. And that has been such a beacon for me because there can be times when you've brought up with, been brought up with insecurities that affect you in that way that you want to speak just right or you want to dress just right. But like Marianne said, she started out in flower sack dresses and she could dress. You ladies admit this woman could dress. She always looked so good. <clears throat> we would be invited to the house and I would always think, what will she serve for dinner? Sunday night after church, the most incredible casserole of hot dogs and beans <laughs> with no apologies. And for heaven's sakes, this family played games around the table. What an idea. And I also learned from her that in her simple but direct impartation and mentoring that I could rise to be a woman that God wanted me to be. I really could. And a lot of the one flesh that Pastor Jack and Anna were has produced in all of us a health and a perspective of who the Father is that we would have never had without them. I know that we have talked about um, her favorite scripture being Nam 1-7. The Lord is good and a stronghold in the day of trouble. And Chip and I went through a very severe marriage crisis in 1984, and the kids and I ended up in their home for about a week and a half. And that woman cooked and did laundry and labored when I couldn't even function. She was really my stronghold in the day of trouble in a very practical way. I don't think there could be enough said about Anna, not enough. And so as we look forward to the time that we will see her once again and have eons 
to talk about things, I know that she finished well. Part of what helps me to know that she finished well was to see all these grandkids up here. Because I think every woman in the room, no matter what your ministry is, what your call is, whatever God has you doing right now in your life, I know mine is that I will finish well with our family, that there will be a legacy that my kids, my, all my kids, the in-law kids, as well as my birth kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids will be able to do what her grandkids did today. Are we perfect? None of us are. But we have had in Anna such an example of the truth and the spirit of the living God. So thank you for the privilege of just having your ears for a few moments and getting to express my thoughts and love for a very, very precious woman in my life. Hi. Uh, oh, there it is. Uh, I'm Cassie Byram. This is my husband, Amic. And when Amic and I got the call from uh, Steve Cobble to uh, sing today for Anna's memorial, uh, he asked us what song we thought we might sing. And really, quite quickly, we both agreed that the song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, would be appropriate. When I, called, when I called Steve back, I said, we'd like to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. There was a pause on the phone call, and I thought, "There's oh, they don't like that song, or there's something wrong. And I thought, hmm. And he said, let me tell you a story, Amick. The story is that soon after the diagnosis, Anna had the diagnosis, Pastor Jack had a conversation with Rex Duvall, a pastor in New York. And during the course of that conversation, Rex said, I have a word for you. Pastor Jack, and I would like to make this suggestion to you. I would like to suggest that you and Anna, every single night before you go to bed, that you would sing this song together. So I was kind of blown away by that, and um, just the fact that the, our, the choice of this song uh, has such an immediate and personal meaning to Pastor Jack right now, and our, it is our prayer that it would have the same immediacy and personal meaning to you, great is thy faithfulness. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Oh. 
and a peace that endureth. Thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide. Strength for today and bright hope for Just remember, darling, all the while you belong to me. See the marketplace in old Algiers and send me photographs and souvenirs. But just remember when a dream.
be loving you always with a love that's true always when the things you've planned need a helping hand I will understand Always Days may not be fair Always That's when I'll be there Always Not for just an hour Not for just a day Not for just a year, but always. Well, I do have to tell you, we'll use this mic, okay. I do, hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> I do um, need to tell you that we're all here to say goodbye to Anna as we glorify Jesus, but there's nobody in this room, uh, family, friends, people that saw Anna as a pastor, who need to say goodbye uh, to the extent of the man that's coming up to the platform right now for over 62 years. He was her partner, best friend, confidant, co-worker in marriage and family and ministry and in following Jesus. I've heard it said many times from Pastor Jack that there would be no Pastor Jack without Anna. But I wanna say today that there would be no ministry of Anna Hayford the way we know it without Pastor Jack. They were together in this and I want us to welcome Pastor Jack as he comes and shares with us. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you first for your patience for the long service, but we're dealing with a great woman, and there's not any short way to do it. I'd returned to the campus of Life Bible College after my first semester. I was a midterm graduate from high school and had a very clear call to ministry and went directly to school just only 10 days after I'd received my high school diploma and began uh, there. And the following autumn, after I'd returned from working my way through the summer to earn money for the next school year, uh, I returned on Labor Day, drove down with a buddy that was coming to school to begin, and we were just walking around campus at Life Bible College, 1952, in the uh, uh, autumn of the, of the year. And uh, I was showing Fred the way around, and we went into Angelus Temple, which was a part of our campus, actually, location at the time, to uh, show him this massive auditorium, uh, renowned globally. and. Uh, when we opened the door, I noticed across the room, it was, there was not a service in progress. There was a rehearsal on the stage down there. We went into the first balcony level, and over there, midway in the balcony, about halfway up the first section of the balcony, it was double balcony, and then the third one above that, and uh, <clears throat> there was a, uh, a small group of kids, and I immediately recognized two of them who had been in school with me the year before, as a matter of fact, uh, Paul, who was there, 
was a guy I'd sung in the college quartet with the preceding year. And so I walked over there and took my buddy with me, and uh, I went to meet this small group. And uh, I was introduced around the group, and we were on a kind of a tour of the campus, my buddy and I, so we didn't plan to stop there. And uh, we just met these kids that were there. There were four new girls together who were uh, in the incoming freshman class. And uh, as we came to the third one, I reached out and uh, when this young woman extended her hand toward me, there is no way to say I did not think this is the most beautiful woman I've ever seen or this is who I'm going to marry. Either of those things you'll hear people say. She was a pretty girl and she had a smile and eyes that would knock you out, but it wasn't that that caught my attention. And I look back on that moment and I know it was a miracle moment for me. I knew her. I'd never met her. I knew what she was like. It sounds peculiar, I suppose, but I knew this woman is clear to the bone real. I just, I just knew that. There wasn't five minutes there in that balcony meeting with the whole group greeting people, but that encounter, when I walked out of the room, off out the balcony door to continue the tour Fred and I were taking, we took two steps outside the door and I said, Fred, you know the short one with the glasses and the long hair? He said, yeah. I said, I'm gonna take her out. That was the 2nd of January, or of uh, September. There was, uh, takes too long to tell today, but uh, how it happened that the following Sunday, the event for the collegians that uh, were attending Angelus Temple, where uh, the school was at that time, that uh, they had a special gathering every Sunday night after church and uh, women in the church uh, made sandwiches for the students because the, the dorm didn't serve dinner on Sunday night. They had a very, very nice dinner at noon, but the cooks got the evening off. And uh, so we, we gathered and sang, praise the Lord, and had a great time. And then there'd be a tremendous fellowship time. And we were only 10 minutes from the dorm. And uh, so people would hang around for the following hour. And it was in that Follow, at the time following while the sandwiches are being uh, swallowed up, especially by us guys, that uh, I had singled out where she was and I worked my way through the group. There's probably 150 college, college kids there. And I came up and uh, just tapped her on the shoulder. She turned around and she recognized me. There's more to this story, by the way, that I love to have her tell that she, uh, knew who I was from my preceding year, where I gained some reputation uh, by reason of uh, probably just being really serious about my school and being a guy that was earnest about the Lord. And whatever leadership capacities that were present in me had begun to show themselves, I didn't realize it, but people saw me in ways that even students that I didn't perceive or try to strive to attain, but at any rate, it was what it was. So Anna had heard about me before I got to on campus because she'd been there for four weeks before, coming out early to find where she could get a job and earn uh, the income for the coming, uh, for, for both of us worked our way through college and uh, she could get a job and go to school at the same time. And uh, when she turned around, I said, hi, and she recognized me, of course, but I didn't recognize that I had press notices before that gave me an advantage over other guys. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, the luau that's coming up, that my buddy and I, in fact, it's the same two of us that had uh, been there in the, in the balcony, that we had performed a skit to advertise the luau. And I said, well, how'd you like Paul's in my skit? And she laughed and she said, yeah, it was great. 
And then we just started visiting. And uh, we just had sandwiches there. It was nothing colorful about the evening, except that I walked her the probably 100-yard walk back to the dorm and uh, dropped her off at the girls' dorm and went to the guys' dorm, and, and that was it. But it was the beginning. It's the next day after church uh, uh, the, of, the, of the evening that, that had taken place. It was the Sunday after I had met her, and uh, that uh, next day, uh, school had gotten out, and the kids were coming out of the building, walking down a uh, steep flight of ch stairs to uh, go over to the dorm. And I saw her coming down, and I just kind of stood away and let the crowd go by and uh, waited until she went by. She didn't see me, and so I got in right in behind her and followed down, and when we got there at the bottom of the stairs, I said, well, are you walking away from me? <laughs> and uh, she turned around and she said, no, I didn't even see you. I said, well, I'm, uh, I'm just here. Are you going over to the dorm for dinner, for lunch? She said, yeah, well, I said, let's go together. And uh, so I didn't waste much time. It was the... <clears throat> On the Sunday, the 13th of September, uh, I asked her to go steady with me. And uh, the, uh, excuse me, it was the, but that, that week that I asked her for another date, and we have had that date at a Luau thing that we went to. And uh, uh, actually, that's a second in sequence. Uh, but it's immaterial to the point when we, the following week, had been together every night walking home from a school. It was that first night that, uh, we, that I ever walked her home after school, and it was a, a longer walk than just the short one we'd had that other time. But when we came to Sunset Boulevard, we were walking along, needed to cross the street, and... Uh, it was about 10.30 uh, at the night. You had to be in the dorm at 11. And after church, there was an hour, hour and a half. Kids just filled a malt shop up on Sunset Boulevard. And the place was a wild place to be in fun and enjoying to joy with everybody but the owner. And uh, although he did rake in cash, but at the expense of a whole lot of noise. And as we uh, came to the boulevard to cross there at... Uh, uh, the place where today the headquarters of the Four Square Church building rises uh, 10 or 12 stories. And we were crossing right at that point. And uh, I reached over and I took her hand. We were in a small group, and I hadn't been holding her hand. And I reached over and took her hand. And just immediately and automatically, our fingers just interlocked, just, just like that. And we walked back to the dorm together that way. And that was the beginning of walking with her home uh, every night that next week. And uh, then it was the Sunday after that that I asked her to go together. But the way it happened was kind of neat. Uh, we were uh, walking over to the dorm after church again after ch Sunday morning, and she said, today Bonnie Greenwood asked me if we were going steady. I said, well, what did you say? She said, well, I, I didn't know what to say. I said, you should have said yes. <laughs> and she, she smiled, <laughs> smiled at me and she said, OK. <laughs> and that's uh, almost all she wrote except for 62 years. The. Uh, the joy of being married to a woman like this is indescribable. It's very humbling. Everything anybody thinks or says about Anna is true and then multiply it over a couple of three times. She is, was, and is, of course, in the presence of our Lord. But I am, in my judgment, the most blessed husband that ever lived. And I'm sure there are other husbands that have been blessed by wives that were the match, God's match for them. 
and feel the same way, and I would concede that in their own opinion for their life. But I could not have had anything of a greater gift for the life we were called to lead or the children that God would bring about through us. I can't imagine a more fulfilling life than I've had. And to uh, say that with no sense at all of exaggeration, no sense of obligation to say it, uh, this is nothing to deny that you go through life together. You have s s strains and arguments and things along the way, but they, they pale. Uh, they're nothing. They're so transient and for the moment significant, but in a part of shaping and uh, sometimes bringing even through the fires of what may be oh, temporary discontent or something one another. We never had any long spats or anything like that or refused to talk to one another. Uh, there were times that uh, your humanity and the reality of each of your imperfection faces, the, faces up to it and you deal with it as you learn to do. But the bottom line really has to do with what's the outcome and uh, if there's been fire in the relationship, well, what you come out with is something that's more deeply branded and more firmly welded together. And that's the uh, story of, of our life. It was uh, the 7th of February, just a little over a month ago, a month and a half ago now, that in the morning up at my devotions, the Lord said, begin this day, and I'm reading from my journal, by the way, I took that page out of my journal. I wrote it down that morning after the Lord had said this to me. In fact, I was journaling when he stopped and he began to give this to me. From this day, escort your lady into my presence. I gave her to you for the mission, the journey, the joy, the family, and the fruitful service of my people, and the advance of the kingdom I would grant you to extend in my name. You have been faithful to one another just as you have been to my calling and the walk and work that it is required. Your coming, your joining together on earth is drawing to a close. I will shortly take her into my eternal presence. Give herself and your time to her lavishly. Prepare, prepare for the joy that is set before her. I will not leave you without comfort and care when she leaves. Indeed, as you have already seen, I have begun preparing you for your tomorrows until I bring you into my eternal presence. Rest and rejoice, your God and Savior are with you and keep moving before you. And I wrote in my journal, thank you, dear Lord, for your word to me. It was uh, a year and two days later that Anna went to heaven. And uh, when I think back on our life, the words that I want to describe it is that she taught my heart to sing. I was a reasonably good singer. I never was really a soloist. I sang in quartets. I sang in choirs. I sang in other choral groups. Enjoyed singing very much in group singing and platform things that did take place with the various groups. <clears throat> but uh, uh, the two of us often sang duets together early in our ministry when there, we were the only talent in the church, which had about nine people. <clears throat> so uh, you came off well no matter, what, no matter how it came out. But Anna did have a pleasant voice, and 
as I said, I sang in groups through the years, and we often sang together, and much often would sing together in the car. The uh, experiences together were never contrived like that. It was just part of our life, and it's normalcy. But when uh, <clears throat> we came to our 10th anniversary, I decided that I was going to write a song for her. And as a result, I wrote a song for her every 10 years of our 60 plus years together. And I want to just tell you quickly about them. The first one was entitled 10 Years Ago Last Summer. And in the song, I say it was 10 years ago that uh, I, we met and that uh, in that summertime that I saw her, uh, that the autumn time, I began to come very clearly that this was the girl that I wanted to spend my life with. And uh, she was resonating very deeply too to our sense of closeness. And uh, I asked her to marry me, as I said, on, uh, on November and the ring was in February. And as the song said, it was 10 years ago last summer, uh, autumn, last 10 years ago last autumn, that I walked through falling leaves with you. And as the gold skies turned to gray, secretly my heart would say, when next summer comes, she'll marry you. It was 10 years ago, last winter, arm in arm, we walked through chilling rain, laughing at the season's storm, for within our hearts were warm with the promise just two hearts could claim. Then in springtime, blossoming time, on your finger there a diamond shone, for I told you, for you told me you'd have and hold me, and when summer came, you'd be my own. Now it's 10 years ago this summer that I walked that aisle and saw your eyes, and that love light lingers still, as I'm sure it always will, for a love like ours can never die, and 10 years from now, I'll tell you why. And uh, I wrote another song 10 years from then, and the title of it was 20 Years. <laughs> well, my dear, it's 20 years we've spent of life together. From here, I can't tell whether it's love or is it me. Something different now appears than first we had together. Like wine, it seems that, uh, and I can't make the rhyme go right now, like why, and it seems that our marriage relationship has a richer quality. And it went on to say, and you and I know the reason, you and I both know the man. He came that day we married, he came. As long, as long ago, he turned the water into wine. Ordinary you and me, now extraordinary, because the man named Jesus poured his life in yours and mine. And I wrote songs for 30 years. She was 50 years old. And I wrote, half a lifetime is enough to know a per the kind of person a person's gonna be. It's a long time, 50 years. But when I look at you, it's, it's still a girl I see. Lady Anna, lady mine, the years have done you well, has done they well for me for my lifetime included years, and God gave you to me. And I mentioned those words to you early, earlier, but I wrote on up through the last two times which I wrote uh, a poem. And I want to read this to you, and uh, then I'm going to conclude. There's so many other things that I would long to say, but I've well passed my time already. Uh, it's the pulpit that does it to you. And, <laughs> I read a poem the other day of words a husband had to say about his dearest's touch, his wife, of whom he'd shared so much of life. His words seemed perfect, so I thought I'd send them like a card I'd bought, but then I stopped. I changed my mind, deciding my own words I'd find. For though his depth of love was clear, they were his words, 
and you're my dear. And your dear touch is only yours. And I have known its warmth for years, so Anna dear, for my own part, I write of your touch from my heart. I tell a sampling of days past, your touch is blessed a thousand ways. For all my life I'll not forget that day soon after we had met, the first time that you touched my hand, the thrill I felt, you understand. For looking back at something we now know was something meant to be, remember with me how one touch turned out to mean so very much. Who would have guessed that autumn night when one brief moment would ignite collegians walking to their dorms, a dozen of us true to form, all joking, laughing, all in pairs, though boy-girl plans weren't serious cares. The moment happened when we stopped back from the malt shop as we talked. Our hands bumped first, and then I dared to take yours in mine, and we've shared a hundred times since then the fact that somehow in that simple act, our hearts became entwined just as your fingers laced with mine. We'll still hold hands someday that way and still your touch, uh, that, so, we'll still hold hands that same way now and still, your, as, and still your touch thrills me somehow. From that touch, who could know the sum of all I've gained in years to come? As you've continued at my side supporting me, we've laughed, we've cried, while times and tide have all changed and turned. Along the way, one thing I've learned, you're always there to touch my hand and say, at all times, I understand. As I've always known that this could, and as you have I, and as you have, and as you have, I've always known that thus I could continue on to gain the promise that I felt as his presence, in his presence, we both knelt and pledged our hands, joined at his throne and pledged ourselves our years to come to him and each other now. Those years have mounted and I bow. I have the embarrassing feeling I already read this part. Did I? Well, I practice it so many times in the last. <laughs> Those years have mounted, and I bow this day of thanks to praise the Lord, whose blessing has been our reward. And as I lift to him my praise, my gratitude for all his grace, one treasured gift he's given me, one that has shaped my destiny. And that is truer than anybody can imagine. One that shaped my destiny evokes a special mention here. Dear Father, thanks for Anna Dear. Her hand in mine has been a sign of your great mercy so divine, who knowing my own limits gave me one whose touch I'd always have to comfort, lift, correct and care, whose tender love and strength could bear with me the mix of trial and joy you foresaw in that girl and boy. I say amen and know that he sees this, that, that, and sees this as no idolatry nor idle sentiment, but true that he has touched my life through you. For looking back that at that first day I felt your touch, I now can say there hasn't been another thing that's warmed my heart or made it sing like your own touch upon my hand. But lest someone misunderstand, as though I viewed a human touch as more than God's, no, nothing such. Instead, I just can't separate the two from that early date. His hand and yours have been as one, his grace to me. You've always shown. My dear, I'm thrilled and thankful for all your touches meant, but more I'm joyous in what's still to come until the God takes us home, until the day God takes us home. For if I am the first to go, it's all right, for I know I'll know your touch on my hand loving me from earth to heaven's eternity. And dear, if you precede me there, these thoughts for us contain no fear of our homecoming, simply joy. I think I see a girl and boy one landless day, meeting again, rejoicing as eternal friends, with countless others hand in hand around God's th throne. At first we'll dance, we'll stand and praise him, then begin to dance his children whose deliverance 
came through the blood of his own cross and saved us from eternal loss. But I also, I believe, will sing of how the wisdom of our King brought sovereign touches to our days as we all journey earthly ways. And as we do, I'll meet your eyes and once more say, I realize how great, how gloriously much the Father gave me through your touch. I bless you. You want to stay up here? I'll sit down. Yeah. We'd like to actually have you hear one of the songs, and Anna Marie is one of the most beautiful songs that I think uh, Dad ever wrote for Mom. Steve's going to present that to us today. There have been a couple of men that have had such uh, significant importance in uh, both mom and dad's lives, dad particularly over the years as uh, prayer partners for 35 years, Dr. Ulmer and uh, Dr. Ogilvy, Would you join me for just a, a moment? Uh, Pastor uh, had really asked that you would just share a, a thought, and I, I, I know that uh, as everybody has asked, how do you go on from here, Pastor Jack? Well, one of the answers is you have good men stand beside you that'll pray for you. And so will you welcome uh, Dr. Lloyd Ogilvy, Dr. <laughs> Kenneth Ulmer. I will never forget my last conversation with Anna. A few weeks ago, I called and we talked on the phone at length. Asked her how she was feeling and what she was going through. And she confided that she knew that she was in her last days. And I felt led to share with her that the Highland Scots people have a way of saying goodbye. 
and it's very significant and it comes from the heart and with an assurance of eternal life. It's simply this. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Little did I know until this afternoon that she had in mind a morning train, as we heard from that song, but uh, we will see her in the morning. Amen. I'll never forget hearing a Scots preacher say, after explaining the fruit of the Spirit, he said, did you hear what I was saying? That if you really allow the Spirit to produce the character of Jesus in you, oh, when you get to heaven, the angels are going to sing together. Oh, oh, how like Jesus she is. And I think that's exactly what they sang when Anna came to heaven. It has been over 25 years that the three of us have been together, praying for one another, weeping with one another. There has not been a challenge. There's not been a celebration. There has not been a mountain or a valley that we have not gone through together. I am especially thrilled when the three of us get together because I'm the baby of the group. <laughs> The last time I saw Anna was the day that Jack and I spent a day together. And um, it was interesting because she was in pain that day and yet so joyful. Um, and I walked through the room where she was and she was watching the TV. And it was the game show, I don't even know the name of it. It was a game show where you choose a door. Door number one, door, Price is Right. Oh, you know it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Door number one, number two, number three. Um, and that was the last time I talked to her. Um, I know what door she chose. Yeah. Here, here. The one for the Father. The one for the Son. The one for the Holy Spirit. The one who said, I am the door. I hear Jonathan saying to David, as David is about to move into the next season of his anointing, he says, we will miss you because your seat will be empty. We will miss you because your seat will be empty. One of the very precious things that Jack shared with me when we were there talking on our last time together was that a week or so before that, he sat maybe out in the, on the grass or out in the yard and that the Lord had told him that in two weeks when you sit here, she'll be gone. We will miss her because her seat will be empty. And yet God will fill that space and void with himself and precious memories. Uh, the psalmist says, God notes every tear that we shed and puts them in his bottle. And so, Jack, we talked a couple of days, and I asked how you were doing, and you said, I had a good cry today. And, and I 
remembered what God said. Every, every tear that you shed, he captured it in his bottle. With mercy and with grace and with strength and with comfort and with encouragement, he captures it in his bottle. He cares just that much for us. A little boy was going with his dad in Boston, down to the Boston Harbor, and they were retiring a battleship that day. A great crowd had gathered down near the harbor as the great ship slowly made its way headed for dry dock. And as they got closer, the little boy could hear the noise of the crowd. And he said, Daddy, what, what's the noise that I hear? And the dad said, Son, a great lady is about to retire. And he went on to tell the little boy about the battles and the victories and the victorious lifespan of this great ship. And the closer they got, the louder the claps came. And the closer they got, the louder the crowd began to rise. And the dad said, little boy said to his daddy, Daddy, why are they clapping? And the dad said, son, a great lady just passed a few days ago. Anna Hayford, a great lady, has just passed. Help me celebrate the life of a great lady who passed our way. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Go ahead, be seated and I want to read the word and, and just make a comment. I had the privilege years ago of being called Pastor Anna's pastor. She called me pastor and the privilege of occasionally rubbing her neck and her shoulders and just serving. We had the joy of relationship that uh, as neighbors, it was incredible. But I hear everybody talk and I, I just want to say three things. I want to read the word. It says these three things are this, because I hear that I want to say, dear God, Help me love with integrity. Help me serve full heartedly. And dear Jesus, help me express it simplistically. That your glory may flow from me as it did from Anna. So let's be comforted by these words where the word says in 2 Corinthians, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our inward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our eternal house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life, now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us this spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, 
knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. You know, it's fantastic that you can celebrate a life even in death because we know death is not our end. Death is just the beginning. Um, you're going to love these words right before we conclude. That's how I want to start my comments right here. I, I just want to say thank you. You know, I know, I, I, I first thank you for spending the time with us to just love and appreciate and and, uh, and care for uh, the family and show your love and appreciation for Anna and to honor Jesus in the process of it. Oh, we, we've heard a great sermon today that's been preached by many, many, many people. And so I, I just want to, on behalf of the family, make just a, a few thank yous today. And I know that's always dangerous because it would be awful to forget anyone. And uh, if I do, please forgive me for that. But uh, our heart of gratitude is, is just so deep for each and every one of you. Uh, you, you. The outpouring of your love, the, the notes, the cards, the, the flowers, the donations to the scholarships, all the things that you've done has just been amazing. And we really do want to thank you uh, for everything that you've, you've done over this uh, time. Steve Cobble, Lana Duem, and Elaine Jones have been three people that have stood with Jack and Anna for years. Um, None of what's happened in this last week would happen if it hadn't been for you guys. I'm not even sure, and with my glasses on, I can't see anybody, uh, but uh, I'm not even sure where Lana and, uh, and Elaine are. But thank you so much, uh, each of you, for, for what you've done. The amount of work and, and everything you've done is so, so special to all of us. I, I want to say thank you to Pastor Tim uh, Clark and for the... Um, whole staff of the church on the way. Countless hours have been put into, into this and in preparation to make everything happen. And the, these are not the kinds of things you really get long, you know, you don't get months to plan for something like this, like you would for a Christmas event. But yet you have made such uh, incredible um, things happen. <laughs> it's, it's so honoring. Tim, you've been my best friend for 30 years since a college kid moved into our home, and uh, I, I'm so honored to serve with you in ministry and love you. Thank you for pastoring uh, my mom and dad. I really appreciate that. Uh, yesterday, Billy Calderwood and the Burbank Foursquare Church provided children's ministry, uh, child care for a lot of the kids of the family with some stuff that we did. Today, uh, Frank Nuno and uh, La Iglesia en el Camino, uh, along with Tiffany, uh, pastor of the children's here, have been doing that for um, our, our kids. and. It's just so touching that people would do that. Uh, our Foursquare uh, uh, president and, uh, and president of the Global um, uh, Council of Foursquare Churches, uh, thank you, uh, Glenn and Debbie, for all that you guys have done, the, the board, the, um, the staff of uh, Foursquare. You know, I know this is not just honoring a past president. This has been loving to uh, people that, that have... I, obviously meant lots to you guys, and you've meant so much to us. Thank you. Um, to uh, the General Superintendent of the Assemblies of God, uh, George Wood, and uh, who's also the, um, the International uh, Assemblies uh, Overseer, I'm so thankful uh, for all that he has done, because that has been just a great blessing of support as well. And for uh, the host of, of pastors, four square pastors, uh, all around the world who have been so gracious and loving during this time. It's really been amazing for the extended ministries that have taken place from whether, whether in Texas or New York or Washington, D.C. or other uh, lands. Hank, I saw you here from uh, uh, Holland. It's just been uh, amazing to see people that have just uh, reached out with love. Thank you. And, um, and then for each of you that invested the time today. Um, I, I pray that your heart has been as touched as mine has been, because all of us have been touched by a really, really great lady. And uh, we really can't conclude our time without one more time giving thanks to the Lord Jesus, who Anna lived her life for and uh, who she stands in the presence with today, whose arms are around her as, uh, as she gets to see the 
the, the reality of the beautiful picture that Betsy, you showed us uh, earlier as she's in his presence. So would you join me and uh, let's give thanks one more time to the Lord Jesus before we make our final presentation here. Hallelujah, Jesus. As I, invite, as I invite Emma uh, up to the platform to help us lead this song that we're about to sing, this song that you sing in these times to remind you that when you know Jesus, death is not the end. When you know Jesus, we're not afraid of this moment. In fact, we rejoice in this moment. And I know that most of you are standing to sing this song, but I, I committed to doing this. I'd like you all to close your eyes if you can right now to provide some privacy because in a time like this, in a place like this, uh, it, it may be unusual. You may think, well, everybody in here who knew Anna who's going to be a part of celebrating a three-plus-hour funeral, a memorial service, is, is a believer. But there may be people in here that are not believers. Maybe you got drugged here by somebody else. Maybe you found your way here for some other reason. Maybe you have never given your life to Jesus Christ or... Some, some point in your life, you gave your life to the Lord, but there's something that happened in this service that pointed the way to Jesus, that allowed your heart to understand that you need to turn around and give your heart to the Lord again to fully embrace Him and all that He has for you. Listen, I know this, that Anna Hayford rejoiced week after week after week when she saw people coming to Jesus. And if you're at her memorial service and you are coming to Jesus or coming back to Him, that would be the greatest gift that you could give Anna Hafer. If you happen to be in this room and that is the reality of your life, you're saying, yes, I need to give my life to Jesus or this is the day that I'm going to turn back around and start following him again. Would you just raise your hand and look at me? And I want to agree with you that today the Lord is going to engage your life. Nobody's looking around. There's no embarrassment. But if you'd say, I need to come back to the Lord. I need to give my life to Jesus again. Is there anybody? Just wave your hand at me if that's you. I want to give the opportunity for that to happen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. This is the second thing I'm going to ask. If there's something that you heard today in this service that allowed your heart to realize there's a way. I'm already following Jesus, but there's a way that I'm going to follow Jesus even more appropriately, intensely engaged because of the way Anna Hayford lived. I'm going to start living that way too. If there's something that challenged you or changed you today in the service, would you raise your hand and say, that was me. That was me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we respond to that and we sing this song with great hope. It is well with our soul. When peace like a river
your servant Anna it's allowed us to remember that we want to be people who followed Jesus like Anna Hayford followed Jesus Lord change our lives I believe there are people that were watching online there are people in the overflows even in this room that have decided to follow you once again because of how Anna Hayford followed you there are many of us God who you've challenged to take up a mantle of grace and love and extension of your life the way Anna extended your life. Lord, we thank you for this time. Let it not stop now, but let us continue to remember who she was in our lives. Let us continue to embrace all that we are different because of her. Let us continue to become people who follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength like Anna Hayford followed you. Now, before I dismiss you, we have to one more time sing this glorious song as Anna sings it around with the throngs around the throne. Let's sing together this song. All hail the power of Jesus' name. You ready? Use your whole voice.
God bless you. You're dismissed.